Oh, thank you, Ashley. Um, <laughs> welcome to the HPC, HPC Best Practices Webinar Series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project funded by the Exascale Computing Project. And this is in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Energy, Computing Facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley from Oak Ridge, and I will be the hosts for today's webinar. 100 flops per watt was a giant leap. The Apollo guidance computer, hardware, software, and application the moon missions. The webinar will be presented by Mark Miller from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, a computer scientist supporting the weapon simulation computing program at Livermore, and he has been doing this since 1995. Among other things, he contributes to a number of uh, big software development efforts like Visit, Silo, HDF5. He's also a member of the Ideas ECP project. And Mark is passionate for, about technology through, uh, throughout history. All attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc. We have pasted those addresses in the, in the chat in WebEx. The webinar will have breaks so Mark can respond to the questions that come in. If we receive a lot of, sort of questions, we'll uh, need to uh, wait until the end of the webinar. So with that, Mark, Mission Control will pass the sharing to you. All right, thank you, Asni. All right, Mark, it should be yours. Okay, I see it, thank you. Okay, can you all see my first slide there? Okay, great. Thank you, Osni, and thank you, Ashley. So, uh, and thanks for this opportunity to talk about the Apollo guidance computer. This week, of course, is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. Um, they launched 50 years ago yesterday, and they uh, will, uh, this Saturday will be the 50th anniversary of the actual moon landing itself. So I'll just give you a brief outline of what I'll uh, walk through today. I'll give you a little bit of background material, just a short amount of background, and then I'll get into discussion about the Apollo Guidance Computer Hardware Architecture itself. I'll spend most of my time on the effort to develop, develop the guidance software for the computer. Uh, I'll take a little bit of a brief detour towards the end into some more historical context in which all this work took place, and uh, hopefully if we have a little time, we'll get into uh, some actual uses of the computer and moon missions. There's a lot of very interesting stories there. Uh, current generation HPC CSE software developers will recognize many common themes, such as flops per watt power constraints, uh, checkpoint restart capabilities, uh, performance portability. Uh, you'll even see a little bit on, about a domain-specific languages. So a lot of uh, a lot of recognizable concepts, even so, even though this work took place over 50 years ago. Now, these are some of the books that I've I've read. Uh, I've read the Apollo Guidance Computer Architecture cover to cover. Um, uh, just fascinated by that book. Uh, the others I've read uh, bits and pieces of. But to be honest, the overwhelming bulk of the material that I reference here and in, in other other uh, resources was from this project, the Virtual AGC project. Uh, contains a bunch of scanned in documentation from 1960s era, which is just fascinating to go through and read. There's just a ton of documentation there. Uh, in addition, I've written a three-part blog series on the Better Scientific Software site uh, about the uh, guidance computer effort. So let's get started talking about the background. So what was the Apollo program? For those that may not be too familiar with it, it was a 10-year uh, effort to land people on the moon starting in 1961. There were seven lunar missions between July 69 and 72. Uh, one of those missions didn't actually succeed in landing. That was Apollo 13, but the other six did. And the Apollo guidance computer was instrumental in the success of these missions. So to put things in context here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the state-of-the-art computers in the 1960s. So this is a picture of the NASA Real-Time Computing Complex, 1964. Uh, the machines of that era, of course, were quite large, uh, taking up huge rooms. They weighed a lot. They took up a lot of power. The mean time between failure was on the order of, you know, days, you know, maybe, maybe weeks. It took a long time to reboot them, and when they did fail, the user interface was very simple, you know, punch cards and paper printouts. 
And most importantly of all, they were down around one flops per watt uh, compute capability. And just for some more context, this is actually a picture of the machine room in building 117 at Livermore Labs back in 1960, and that's the Livermore Advanced Research Computer 1. It was a UNIVAC system. So by 1966, uh, NASA and MIT and uh, Raytheon had built this uh, uh, Block 2 Apollo guidance computer. The uh, large sort of copper box on the left there is the actual computer itself, and the um, keyboard and uh, display here called the disk key was what the inter astronauts actually interfaced with to interact with the computer. It was uh, very small, didn't weigh very much, only used 55 watts of power. It had a mean time between failure of, of several months, um, actually even more than that. It could reboot in seven seconds, which is amazing. And the user interface was actually pretty novel for the time using a sequence of what they called verb and noun keystrokes to interact with the uh, computer. Most importantly, it was uh, very high flops per watt compute capability, which they needed. So to put uh, where the where the computers actually existed on the spacecraft, that's the whole Saturn rocket there and the Apollo spacecraft at the top. <clears throat> so there's two spacecraft there. There's the command and service module there on the left and the lunar module on the right. And each of those is actually broken into two pieces. The lunar module has its descent stage and ascent stage, and then the command and service module has the main service module and the command module, which is the only part of the ship that actually can survive reentry into the Earth's atmosphere. So they, uh, there were main engines. They had the command service module main engine, the lunar module descent main engine, and the ascent main engine. And then all these little jets on the side were attitude control thrusters that allowed the computer to basically control the attitude and direction that things were, were moving around. Uh, and I should say also the, gim the engines on the descent stage of the uh, lunar module and the engine on the command service module gimbaled. That means it, it could be moved around a bit. <clears throat> So there was a, uh, a guidance computer actually in both, uh, both spacecraft in the lunar module and another one in the command module. This is a view of the disk key, what the inter astronauts actually uh, interacted with to interact with the computer on the command module control panel. And this is a view of it in the lunar module control panel. In the lunar module, the astronauts would stand on the left and right of that uh, control panel looking out those triangular windows. So what was the role of the computer? So I had to work that in oh, one of my favorite movies, Star Wars. Uh, basically the role of the computer was to in powered and coasting flight manage the state vector, which was the position and position rates and attitude and attitude rates uh, as, as the spacecraft moved through space. And to do this real, in real time, accurately and reliably and autonomously. And I, I focus on autonomous for just a moment here because we hear a lot about, for example, autonomous driving today. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue and uh, it requires a lot of compute today just to do this for driving. As a matter of fact, just April this year, Tesla um, announced the release of its own chips, that Tesla is designing its own computer chips to do the self-driving on their newer fleet of vehicles. They designed these chips to support that in their cars. So they think it's a big enough problem to actually design their own compute resources to do it. <clears throat> so the computer had this role, but it, it, it faced many constraints and challenges. And I list several here. I can't focus on all of them, but I did want to focus on one, which is the changing center of mass as fuel is consumed and sloshes around. So this is actually a, a video from inside the upper stage of a SpaceX Falcon rocket. And uh, you see what's happening here is initially the engine's thrusting at about five Gs of acceleration and all the fuel's in the bottom of the tank. But as soon as that engine cuts out, it just starts to slosh around. Um, kind of a big problem when you, when you need to basically control the spacecraft and understand where its center of mass is. So an example of the kind of maneuver the computer would have to help the spacecraft execute is lunar orbit insertion. Um, in this case, the spacecraft's moving at about two miles per second as it arrives at the moon. It's gonna be within a distance of about 60 miles of the lunar surface. And the round trip signal at these distances from the Earth to the moon is about two and a half seconds. So if you were thinking you could do this uh, by a ground-based computer, the delays are just too long. 
And on top of that, in order for this burn to actually work, it needs to occur on the far side of the moon, which means you're out of uh, communication with the Earth anyways. So that's it for the background. We'll now move on, talk a little bit about the hardware architecture. And Ashley, I don't know if this, uh, these slides may represent a good stopping point just to see if there are any questions. So let me just ask. We are good, Mark. Keep going. Okay. All right. So now we'll move on to the architecture of the computer. <clears throat> so it had a 16-bit word size. Um, uh, there was one bit for parity, so that gave us 15 useful bits in each word, uh, approximately one megahertz clock, 1.024. Every uh, machine, execute, machine instruction execution was actually decomposed into a micro sequence of 12 instructions. There were four central registers and 15 special purpose registers. And all of this was implemented with 2,800 integrated uh, circuits. Um, and each of those circuits was composed of two three input NOR gates. So that's a, a picture of the actual NOR gates that were used and give you an idea of their size. Um, this is an invoice actually from 1962 from MIT to Fairchild Semiconductor. It says up there in Bedford, Massachusetts, but actually the, uh, manufacture, the their manufacturing site was out in Sunnyvale, so uh, an area that would eventually become known as Silicon Valley. Uh, but this is for 1,000 of those uh, dual input NOR gates at $31 a piece back in 1962. I should say that by 1965, the program was consuming over 50% of all the integrated circuits the country was producing at the time. It also had 2K words of erasable memory that was implemented using coincident current core, so very uh, a typical memory of that era. The really interesting aspect of the computer is the use of uh, its fixed memory, 36K words of fixed memory, which was implemented using woven rope core. And in this technique, what you do is you thread wires either through cores to represent a logical one or around a core to represent a logical zero. And as you thread, and, and you thread, you can thread wires through arrays of cores to basically knit an entire program into the arrays of cores. This is an image of a Raytheon worker actually doing that by hand for an early version of an AGC rope core memory. Um, we, it turns out weaving in its place of computing actually goes back much, much further in uh, history to the Jacquard loom. So it actually has a very interesting uh, relevance in this context. This is a video of uh, people working actually hand weaving the wires through the rope cores at this time. Eventually Raytheon improved this process by doing some machine assistance, which is going on here. This machine passes a reticle over the cores and the operator then moves the uh, wire back and forth through the various cores or around them. It goes through or around them. Um, they hired an army of women from the New England area to do this. They were all experienced textile workers. So both RAM and ROM in the AGC were non-volatile memory, which uh, NVM actually has relevance in today's machines, how to, how to exploit it and uh, where to locate it on machines. So uh, very interesting uh, story, actually. There's a, a group down in Sunnyvale that just last week, just last Friday, actually got the one and only operating Apollo guidance computer up and functioning. And they read out of that computer the uh, 2K erasable memory that had been sitting in it for the last 50 years. Um, yeah, very interesting. There's some videos about that on YouTube. So this is what the computer looks like if you sort of separate that that copper housing in half, like a clam, open it up like a clamshell. Over here on the uh, on the right is where all the NOR gates were to form the uh, you know the registers, the ALU, and all the other logic components of the machine. And on the right is basically all the memory, fixed and erasable memory, timing, power supplies, and so forth. So again, it had four central registers, an accumulator, program counter, the Q register, which stored the, the remainder after division, the L register, which stored the lower products after multiplies. The Q register also served as the return address for jump to subroutines. There were a number of other special purpose registers as well. For example, editing registers. You could write data to a particular register and just the act of writing it would shift it up or down some number of bits. There were eight basic instructions in the instruction set and 33 extended instructions. Uh, this is just a, a real simple code snippet. Um, the opcodes are there in red, but the uh, the interesting thing about this code snippet isn't so much the, the opcodes or the instructions, but it's the actual um, comments from the developers that exist in the code. By the way, 
all of the source code, well, most of the source code for the Apollo missions is actually now available on GitHub, and it actually runs on a virtual Apollo guidance computer um, simulation. So you can find all this code on GitHub. Another very interesting thing about the computer that's worth mentioning as part of its architecture was the interpreter, which uh, the way to think about it, that was essentially, essentially a space guidance domain specific language. Uh, it's a P code machine, like a Java virtual machine. It had its own virtual register set and its own virtual instruction set, which included single, double, triple precision vectors, loads and stores, vector adds and subtracts, you know, square roots, dot products, normalizations, transcendental functions. So um, the reason that they had to implement this was it gave them a huge form of compression because the only memory they had to work with was either the 2K of erasable memory or the 36K words of fixed memory. So everything they did had to fit into that memory. So this gives you an example of a um, interpreter, uh, a little bit of interpreter code to compute the following, the, the uh, the expression up there in red, which is a vector Z equals a scalar A times a matrix M times the sum of two additional vectors X and Y. And that turned out to take seven words of fixed memory and the actual instructions are there as well. I won't go into them. So what do the numerics look like? So integers were represented as one complement big Indian sign, uh, sign magnitude effectively. So there was one bit for parity and one bit for sign. So it left 15 bits over for magnitude. And this meant that it had to deal with both positive and negative zeros in the software. And they found up with novel ways of exploiting that to uh, uh, detect and use for various, uh, various algorithms. And they also have to deal with fractional data. So they didn't have a floating point representation. What they had is effectively is uh, it's a fixed point representation where each bit represents the halves, the quarters, the eighths, the sixteenths. And the coders must be then dealing with the proper scaling with the proper exponents for um, all of the, uh, the values stored in fractional form were. This is actually very much like how an engineer's slide rule works. The slide rule allows you to calculate the fractional parts and you have to maintain separately a note to yourself on what the magnitudes and scaling of all the, all the values are. That does lead to additional complexities in software development. So again, single, double, triple precision arithmetic with fractional numbers and the times to do summation uh, multiplication and division are listed there. Um, it's probably more relevant to look at this, this plot or uh, bar graph though. This is a comparison of the Apollo guidance computer in blue, uh, the IBM 36020 in orange, which was released also in 1966. And uh, the Oak Ridge's summit machine, the current ABM AC, I, IBM AC 922 system at Oak Ridge. Uh, in terms of flops per kilobyte over there on the far left, flops per watt, flops per kilogram, flops per cubic meter, and flops per dollar. Um, in, in every way, the AGC actually ex, uh, excelled above the IBM 360 at that time by sometimes as much as three orders of magnitude or more in terms of performance. And of course, Summit beats them all. Um, so the AGC executive was the name of the process that actually managed, uh, managed the work that the computer was doing. And that work was divided into two classes of processes, one for really small processes, it called tasks, which were very short, less than five milliseconds. Sometimes all a task did, all, its only reason for existence was to turn around and schedule a job. Jobs run for much longer. They were actually priority scheduled and jobs could adjust their own priority up or down. Uh, priority scheduling was actually uh, pretty innovative for its time. The system also supported something uh, uh, of akin to checkpoint and restart, but uh, they called it at the time waypoints and restarts. Only certain critical guidance routines were restart protected. So not everything in the system was restart protected, but some were. Um, this ended up consuming about 50 uh, four percent of the fixed memory this particular feature of the machine and so there was some question late in the project of whether or not it had merit it turns out in apollo 11 landing if this feature didn't exist they would have actually had to abort the landing we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the talk there were two kinds of io o devices in the system um, i'll just change uh, to the picture that shows them. So in the command module there on the left, it's showing all the different interesting devices that the computer had to interact with. The astronaut's hand controller, 
the inertial measurement unit, um, optics, which served as sort of a space sextant for the command module, the main engine, its gimbal and so forth, and the attitude control thrusters. And then over here on the right on the lunar module, a similar set of things. Uh, landing radar, the, of course, the command module didn't need that, but the lunar module did. So there are some differences between the two systems. The uh, items circled in green here were very low uh, update rate interfaces, so less than about 10 hertz, and they were handled by interrupts, um, where the, the IO device basically interrupts the computer, the computer executes an interrupt service routine to process data from that IO device, and then control returns to wherever it had been interrupted. In the case of these higher bandwidth devices, for example, the rendezvous radar, the IMU, it used a, a different form of interacting with the future, computer called cycle stealing, where the device basically, the program counter stops temporarily and the device takes over the bus of the computer and routes the data over that bus to wherever it needs to go in memory. And that also will become relevant on the Apollo 11 mission. The machine also had a fault tolerance incorporated at many levels. I'll, I won't go into all of them here, but I'll talk about a couple of them. One of them was sort of a jog hog or freeze detection. There was actual circuitry hardware in the system to detect that a particular memory location known as new job was at read at least once every, I think, 960 milliseconds. And if a period of time elapsed where that particular memory location was not referenced, it would conclude that there was some job that was hung and it would, start a, it would do a restart. Uh, the reason for this is because everything was priority scheduled, the underlying executive was constantly supposed to be checking, is there a new job? And it would read this word. And if that didn't happen, it would suggest something seriously wrong. Ultimately, the system had a mean time between failure of 40,000 hours, and that's due to the quality of the integrated circuits that they had to construct it from. It turns out that to achieve these levels of reliability today, what uh, things like the space shuttle and uh, uh, newer spacecraft use is triple redundant hardware and a voting system. Okay, so that's it for the hardware architecture. Um, uh, I, should I pause here, Osney, for questions or continue? Mark, we, we do have one question here, going back some slides. How did they validate that the code stored in the ROM was correct? Okay, so they had, uh, yeah, that's uh, after they do all that knitting and weaving, they all, so they know exactly what uh, data should be in there. You can think of that rope core as basically just a bunch of zeros and ones of data. So they knew exactly what should be in there. All they'd have to do is basically read the rope core memory and compare it to the data they expected to be there. And if there were failures, then that would mean that one of those wires somewhere in that massive array of cores was not wired correctly. And then fixing that would be a major headache it would often mean that you would pitch one of the rope core modules you'd manufacture and start a new one. Okay, Mark, please continue. All right, um, so now we'll move on to the, uh, I think even more interesting aspect of the project, it was just the work to develop the guidance software. And uh, that there is a stack of uh, all the different printouts for different uh, uh, flight programs for different missions, um, and Margaret Hamilton st standing next to that. We'll talk about her a little bit later. So this is the actual Western Union telegram that uh, MIT Instrumentation Lab received uh, at 1961 from NASA to tell them that they had been selected to develop the Apollo guidance uh, system. And it says there in the bottom, the covering the first year is an estimated four million, which in 2019 dollars would probably be over 40 million. So pretty big project at least at the start, turned out to be much bigger than that. I'm quoting here from a couple of uh, references about the, uh, the early stages. So MIT received a contract based on only a short, very general requirement statement. Requirements started changing immediately and continued to change throughout the program. So midway through the program, it turns out the guidance computer was fully redesigned to increase its memory by a factor of eight and to increase the speed of its numerics by a factor of two. So what they had by the by about 1966, they had two different versions. They called Block One and Block Two. The Block One version was used in all the Apollo uncrewed flights, and Block Two was used in all the crewed flights. But these systems were different enough that they actually needed uh, different software development teams to support the development of the guidance software that went into them. So this basically just increased the software development burden. 
Now, back in 1961, when MIT received that memo, all the stuff you see pictured here, all the hardware, none of this was known at the time. It was not known for another year, in fact. NASA hadn't even decided for another year how they were actually going to get to the moon. So this, this process of using these two vehicles and uh, lunar orbit insertion to actually get, uh, or I'm sorry, lunar orbit rendezvous to actually get to the moon, this was not known. So you can imagine you're starting to develop a computer and you need to develop guidance software on that computer and literally none of the information that you see presented here now was known. This represents an extreme co-design problem. Everything was being developed essentially simultaneously. And this gives you an idea of the sort of communication pathways between all of the different organizations that were involved with MIT Instrumentation Lab and NASA in the center there. But people, the, uh, the organizations and vendors developing the optics or developing, actually manufacturing the computer, that was Raytheon. The uh, Grumman and Northrop American who were developing the lunar module and command module, all those agencies needed to be interacting on a regular basis. You can imagine how hard that problem would be in 1960, you know, the 60s, when we don't have any of the very useful collaboration tools we now have today to support co-design. So the essential step that MIT software developers needed to perform was to assemble a flight program and then release that to Raytheon for rope core manufacture. They needed to do this about four months ahead of a launch. That would be two months to actually weave the ropes, although Raytheon did get faster at that later on. And then two months to install the computer in the spacecraft, run crew rehearsals, and so forth. And they needed to do this for approximately 30 flights that were planned uh, in the 1960s. Some of those flights had very unique guidance requirements, which meant that the software being needed to be developed for them could not be necessarily useful in other flights. So how does, uh, so basically a mission was divided into phases by velocity changes, delta V, uh, that's the big question. So these are burns of the main engine that change the velocity of the spacecraft as it moves between the Earth and the Moon. A lunar mission is composed of about 11 burns. This is a wonderful poster that NASA produced uh, in the late 60s that show all the different phases of an Apollo mission. But for every unique maneuver, every unique engine burn, there was a major mode program in the guidance computer to handle it. So in, in, uh, in modern terms, we'd say for, for every major mode pro or for every maneuver, there was an app for that. And to give you an idea, this is a lunar module, uh, the, the major mode programs that were involved in the lunar landing itself. It was decomposed into three major modes, program uh, P63, which is the braking phase. The whole purpose of that was to basically slow the velocity of the lunar module. And then program P64 was the visibility phase or approach phase where the astronauts can actually see the surface out the window and start planning their landing. And then finally P66, the terminal descent phase. To give you an idea of the software development processes, what, what went into them, I'll talk a little bit about the ephemeris routines. That's basically knowing the position of the moon at any moment. You can imagine that's a relatively important thing for the guidance computer to be able to know is where is the moon at any particular moment and any time any piece of guidance software needs to ask that question. So it needs to know it accurately over a sufficiently long period. A mission lasted approximately two weeks and to do it without consuming too many resources, memory or time. A good question is, in the early 60s, how do you actually get the ground truth data for the moon position over any two week period in the future? Uh, it turns out this was a classically studied problem by a number of early scientists, uh, Newton, Euler, Lagrange, uh, others studied this problem. Uh, but another, another researcher by the name of Brown had developed a lunar theory and by 1919 had some pretty uh, uh, good tables for defining the position of the moon over time. And we could use that with mainframe codes and Fourier series to actually produce data to check our algorithms. So that's what they did in the 1960s. Of course, today, an, an amateur astronomer can walk outside their house and point a laser at the moon and, and get information on exactly where it is very accurately, very quickly. But we couldn't do that in the 60s. Their ultimate solution to this problem was to fit the XYZ positional data with the polynomials. So they had eight double precision coefficients <coughs> for each of the XYZ uh, uh, positional data. That actually was 48 words of fixed memory. 
and then the subroutine that you could call and query and ask what's the moon's position and velocity was an additional 86 words of interpreter uh, code. So a total of 100 and, uh, what was that, 112, 100, 100, 130 words of uh, memory could basically store everything we needed to know about the moon. What they did initially was they implemented this in something called the MAC language. It's the MIG algebra, I'm sorry, MIT algebraic compiler language on a Honeywell 1800 mainframe and confirmed all their ideas worked. And then they re-implemented it in AGC uh, interpreter code. And then those, that code became part of every flight program that flew in every mission. <clears throat> now, something to keep in mind here, what if you store into memory these, this, this data in, in rope core memory and then the launch gets delayed two weeks? Now that rope core is completely useless to you. So what Raytheon needed to do was actually man, manufacture a number of contingency ropes in case there were delays. And then they'd have to pull the computer out of the spacecraft, pull its memory out and stick in new rope core to deal with those problems. So there was a number of pieces of infrastructure software that MIT worked on earlier on. Uh, functions we've already talked about, such as the executive for uh, long-running jobs, the waitlist for short-running tasks, uh, a down telemetry function, which allowed the computer to send to ground control uh, all the key parameters that it was uh, managing at the time, the restart functionality we talked about, and various other things. All of this infrastructure software consumed about 22% of, of fixed memory. So another really important thing was the digital autopilots. And this represents a, uh, for in today's parlance, the work on the digital autopilots actually represented a huge performance portability challenge. So we have many different hardware configurations and we have, we hope to have one software implementation that runs on them. So uh, this is the spacecraft as they're docked together, uh, but they're not always uh, joined in this configuration. So you have to deal with just the command and service module by itself just the lunar module upper uh, ascent descent stages by itself. Then there's just the lunar module upper stage. Then there's just the command module during ballistic reentry. Um, and then there's this interesting configuration that's only ever, this configuration only ever occurred on one Apollo mission. It happened on Apollo 13 just before they uh, reentered. Uh, but we have now to try to develop software, uh, digital autopilot software that actually supports all those configurations. So that represented a huge performance portability challenge. What they ultimately uh, used was a technique called Kalman filtering. In that technique, there's a prediction phase where the computer uses an idealized model for the spacecraft's motion to predict uh, where it's gonna be in the future. And then their comparison phase where it actually uses the spacecraft sensors to uh, measure where it actually is. And then based on the difference between as predicted and measured, it, it uh, develops control decisions, decisions on, on which thrusters it should fire and when. Um, I can't get into the details here, but this is basically a common filter control law switching curves for when it would switch uh, uh, attitude thrusters during coast, coasting flight to maintain the spacecraft attitude. So at the end of the day, the way they solved this performance portability challenge is they had a set of pre-programmed parameters and switch settings that the astronauts would have to set. And this is an example of the digital autopilot settings for the command module. And some of these are actually switches that the astronauts would set. Uh, things like the rate maneuver is how much the filter would allow the spacecraft to rotate on any axis. So here's one where it's set to zero. It's very, very fine grained controls. Uh, five uh, hundredths of a degree per second, all the way up to two degrees per second. So the astro in it, for any particular maneuver, the astronauts would have to set what they want the digital autopilot to be, and then that software would execute according to those parameters. So here I'm trying to picture what I call the AGC software stack. We talk a lot about software stacks fairly uh, uh, in, more recently. Um, in the erasable memory, what we stored is all the, uh, what was stored there was all the shared variables and all the state of the spacecraft and, and various other uh, values that needed to change over time. Also, uh, data that came in from various uh, I.O. devices that the computer interacted with. And then in rope core memory was all of the guidance routines, uh, major mode programs, the autopilots, um, a lot of the, the, the domain specific language called the interpreter. 
Um, the disk key, this is what actually allowed the astronauts to type in on the uh, disk key and have values display. There was a routine that managed that, uh, various other things. So that's basically how the software was organized. So how did they test all this? Well, testing became, uh, it took almost 50% of the whole effort. They wrote an all digital simulator to simulate the AGC computer itself, instruction by instruction. So, um, so there's a simulator of the AGC itself. Then they had to simulate all the IO devices that interacted with, and finally they had to uh, simulate the spacecraft environment. So they had to simulate things like the bending modes of the spacecraft and fuel sloshing around in the tanks. That was all implemented in all digital simulator. And ultimately, they, uh, MIT had to buy two IBM 36075s and Honeywell 1800s to support all the testing. They were using this, this test hardware 24 hours a day, seven days a week for months and months and months developing the software. There were several other levels of testing that they also used. Uh, one really key part of testing was they actually did uh, in-flight testing. So this is data from Apollo 9. Uh, the stuff on the far left isn't as important, but uh, here in the middle, they were comparing simulated to actual outer gimbal engine gimbal angles on the lunar module descent stage. And there's obviously a huge discrepancy between the dotted line here and the dashed uh, of the solid line. They discovered they weren't modeling one of the bending modes of the spacecraft correctly, and uh, they added that into the all digital simulator, and they get a much more uh, but much better agreement with the data finally after that. They discovered this after they ran, and I should say they discovered this problem after they ran the um, uh, Apollo 9 mission and tested the lunar module in Earth orbit in Apollo 9. Um, so stepping back and sort of looking at the whole effort overall, uh, these uh, over here on the far left are various flight program releases starting back on very early Block 1 computers. They used fairly creative names early on, such as Sunrise and Corona, Sundial and Aurora. But later on, they just called the command module software Colossus and the Lumin uh, lunar module software Luminary. So all this stuff over here on the very far left was used in uncrewed missions, and these various other releases were for crewed missions. Um, this is sort of a Gantt chart that's uh, describing various releases and all the effort that went into them. So this particular release, and uh, I forget which, it's, it's hard to read that, I'm not expecting people to read that, uh, but went through Eclipse, finally Sunrise and Corona before it was finally actually used or attempted to be used in a mission. One thing to notice is, notice how actually short these development lines are for later missions. So here's an Apollo 9, all the work that went into Apollo 9, it's basically reusing most of the code that was developed in earlier Apollo flights. And uh, Apollo 11 is right, right here. I'm, not, I'm saying right here, assuming people can see my pointer as I move it on the screen. Hopefully you can, but if you can't, I uh, apologize for, for that. Um, finally, down here in the lower right uh, is the manpower effort over time. The uppermost curve is the total manpower, and the uh, lower curve here is the software development manpower, peaking at about 350. Um, let's see. Uh, the project was about 25 billion in 1965, which equates to just a little over 200 billion in 2019 dollars. And if you average that over the 10 year period of the project, it would have been 20 billion a year. Um, the guidance system itself was 600 million in 65, which translates to 5 billion in today's dollars or about uh, uh, 500 million per year. The software effort alone was 60 million, uh, which translates to about 100 million per year in today's dollars because the software was really compressed into five years. This gives you a rough idea of the level of effort in each aspect of software development, analysis, coding, testing, documentation, and management. Uh, by, by testing, by the way, here, I'm actually referring um, not to the hardware resources used in testing or the personnel necessary to support testing, but the just test development processes. Um, just some quotes from uh, documentation uh, that I found. The need for formal validation rose with the size of the software. Programs of 2,000 words took between 50 and 100 test runs, and full-size flight programs took 1,000 to 1,200 runs. The term software engineering was actually uh, introduced by this woman, Margaret Hamilton. She was one of the lead developers on the Lunar Module Flight Program. She did so to bring the software effort legitimacy so that in those building it would be given due respect. No one doubted the quality of the software. It was the process used in development that caused great concern. 
Uh, one uh, lesson learned was they needed up-to-date documentation, and I was shocked to discover that back in 1965, uh, they actually had an automatic documentation generation uh, tools at the time, which uh, I use auto documentation tools now in, in several other projects, so I was very intrigued to discover that somebody was actually trying to solve a similar problem back in 1965. Good development plan should be created and executed. So uh, that completes the section of guidance software. Uh, and I'll just pause for a minute, Osni. How are, uh, uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. We do have one question here, Mark. What was software testing like? Unit testing, integrated testing, et cetera? Uh, I think most of it was integrated testing at the end of the day. I mean, they they do they did do unit testing, but most of the unit testing would be done with prototype software on the mainframes in the uh, more mainframe languages of the day, such as uh, Mac Fortran um, or just Fortran. When it finally got time to test the uh, test the guidance routines, they you know they really couldn't be tested in isolation because of all the interplay between different pieces of software sharing memory locations and erasable memory it just be it, doing unit testing would only get you so far in understanding the validity of a particular uh, bit of software please continue okay so i'm going to take a brief detour now and talk a little bit about the historical context uh, of people working on the project um, so I'll just go through several pictures. These are the Mercury 7 astronauts. The Mercury project was uh, one of the uh, predecessors to the Apollo project. This is the astronauts in the Gemini program. These are uh, many of the folks that were sort of in, in, in the lead of the Apollo guidance computer effort itself. These are the Apollo astronauts. Uh, this is mission control, Apollo mission control. Uh, these are the only people that have ever walked on the moon. And so one thing you see there, and, and you see in a lot of uh, stuff, you get the impression that only white men were involved in the, in the project. Um, and it turns out that that's sort of the nature of the 1960s at the time, but it turns out it's also not true. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you find out a lot of other interesting things. For example, in the early 1960s, uh, there were 13 women that were uh, tested and passed. Uh, these were all pilots, and they all were tested and passed all of the rigorous testing that the Mercury 7 astronauts passed because they were being at least put, uh, put forward as possible candidates for, for astronaut training. It turns out none of them got their chance to become astronauts um, for reasons that existed in the 1960s, but there's a wonderful Netflix documentary about the Mercury 13 I encourage people to watch. It's a fascinating part of history that I just didn't know of until recently. Um, this is the first woman to get, go into space, Valentina Tereshkova. She spent three days in orbit uh, in 1963. We, I, we didn't send uh, an American woman into orbit until 1986. Uh, but turns out women have uh, a long history with computing as well. And it turns out the word computer itself has only referred to a machine only recently in human history, only within the last, say, 70 years. Prior to that, the word computer referred to one who calculates. And so tedious calculation was often viewed as, quote, women's work. And in the Manhattan Project, when they had large calculations they needed to perform, they'd actually use the unit kilogirl to understand how many, how many people they were going to need to put on a particular computational effort. But between the 40s and the 60s, computers uh, were almost exclusively women. Uh, so I'll just go through a few pictures here. This is Harvard Observatory in 1890. Uh, this is Oak Ridge, 1942. Los Alamos, 1943, um, Bletchley Park, 1944. This is the uh, British effort to break the German Enigma codes. The Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, this is the Langley West Computing Group, which is the uh, women that the movie Hidden Figures is about. And uh, NASA, 1962. So you would think with all of those women involved in computing that the we would have just moved on to a situation where there's a lot of women getting BS degrees in computer science. And while indeed that uh, started to be true between the 70s and mid 80s for uh, a number of reasons we've had a sharp decline uh, reasons I can't explain uh, but uh, hopefully we can fix this problem on the Apollo guidance computer project itself there were a lot of women involved uh, up here in the upper left I, I mentioned already they had an army of textile workers that actually helped manufacture the Apollo guidance computer rope course 
Um, in terms of developing the software and supporting the whole effort, there were four women that I'm at least aware of now, Margaret Hamilton and Phyllis Rye, who are pictured here in a, a, a control room at NASA. Uh, Sadine Zeldin and Elaine Denniston, I think, were also involved in, in software development and testing. This uh, red arrow here points to one and only woman that actually was allowed in the uh, mission control room. Her name was uh, Joanne Morgan. So also there were a number of people of color involved in the project. Uh, William Mallory was a test engineer that worked at MIT during the 60s. Ramon Alonzo was a uh, immigrant from Argentina. His family immigrated to the US in the 30s and he was one of the lead engineers on the uh, AGC hardware architecture. Robert Pigney was hired in the mid 60s to support software development at MIT. And then these two individuals, I'd never heard of them before, uh, Captain Ed White, Dwight and Robert Lawrence were uh, selected to become astronauts, uh, Ed White in 1963 and uh, Robert Lawrence in 1967. Um, so, uh, and nonetheless, neither of them got their chance to become astronauts for uh, uh, different reasons. So uh, the final person I wanted to talk about, and I just don't think you can talk about the Apollo program without mentioning him, is uh, Werner von Braun. He was the creator of the V-2 rocket, uh, which rained terror on cities in, uh, in Europe. Um, he was a member of the Nazi party, but ultimately arrested by the SS for suspicion of loyalties. He was captured and brought to the US with about 1,600 other German scientists in 1945, uh, many of them former Nazis. And it turns out that when they were brought to the US, the US was still holding in internment camps uh, uh, American citizens of Japanese descent. Kind of a remarkable irony. But nonetheless, Werner von Braun led the development of the F-1 engine, uh, which was the engines on the Saturn booster, and we would not have gotten to the moon without, uh, without that booster. And ultimately, to complete his story arc, he ultimately became a champion of racial integration in Wallace's Alabama because he was the director of uh, Marshall Space Flight Center at Huntsville, Alabama. So a very interesting story arc. So that's the end of my brief detour. I don't know if any people had any questions about that. No, no questions, Mark. Okay. So it looks like I have maybe uh, eight minutes left here to talk about mission applications, which is, which is great. Um, I wasn't sure I'd have time to get to them. So as I said before, the astronauts interacted with the, uh, with the computer through this uh, disk key, this display and keyboard. You can see the buttons verb and noun here. To uh, a verb would basically be an action to take and a noun would be an object on which to take that action. So verb 06 would say, I want to display some data in decimal and noun 37 might be, give me my uh, XYZ velocities. So they'd hit verb 06, noun 37, enter. And the, then what would get display here is may, maybe the XYZ velocities. There were two of these in the command module, one of them in the lunar module, and then one on the ground in Houston. So Houston could actually see what they were typing into the computer. Um, they had this uh, cheat sheet. They probably had this memorized at the end of the day of all the verbs and nouns. This isn't a complete list. I just uh, truncated the image to give you an idea of what they, what they had. So let's talk about Apollo 11 itself. Very interesting history of Apollo 11. Uh, I'll start with uh, Russian Luna 15. It turns out the, uh, at the time that Aldrin and Armstrong were ascending from the surface, this Russian probe was actually trying to land. Um, not actually too far. It, I mean, it was rough, roughly approximately the same parts of the moon. And so for the first time, Russia and the US exchanged information about their programs to avoid any problems. Um, the intention here in the Russian program is actually a sample return mission. So this probe was supposed to land on the moon, gather up a little bit of stuff, put it into a container, and actually fly back to Earth, which they did successfully uh, do in 1970, I think it was 72. But this particular mission failed. But it's just ironic that it was actually landing at just about the same time that Armstrong and Aldrin were ascending from the lunar surface. Um, so uh, during the Apollo 11 descent, it turns out the program issued several, uh, the, the computer issued several alarms, program alarms. And as it executed those alarms, you can imagine you're looking at the computer here and it's giving you some useful information. And then all of a sudden you look down and you see this restart and the computer is completely blank and they're in the middle of trying to land the lunar module. Um, this happened four times during the Apollo 11 descent. 
It turns out there was a young person by the name of Jack Garman uh, in the control room at Houston that had made a cheat sheet of all the different alarm codes the computer could produce at the time and had a, pre, a pre-understanding of what those codes meant and what the answer was. Uh, but for 30 long seconds, Armstrong was right waiting on the go, no-go signal as the spacecraft ascending fairly rapidly towards the surface. And Jack Garman is the one who actually used his cheat sheet and gave the go decision to to don't worry about those alarms, ignore those alarms, continue. And of course the computer, because it could restart in seven seconds, it basically, even though it went blank, it restarted and picked up where it left off and the lunar module continued its descent just fine. Um, what was happening? So there's a lot of stories online about what was happening. You know, they, the computer was malfunctioning and, and Armstrong had to take over manual control, or there was a, a checklist item that Aldrin had, hadn't done correctly. Um, all of those are just approximations of the truth. Ultimately, what they had happen was a hot I.O. device. The rendezvous radar was not interfaced to the computer correctly. It had to be phased, the power in the rendezvous radar had to be phase locked with the power in the computer, and it was not. Uh, this was actually something that was missing in the documentation for assembling the system. Because it wasn't, it was actually issuing instructions to the computer, well, well cycle stealing the computer at the rate of 12.5 kilohertz, the maximum rate it could. So all these cycles that it was stealing to update the computer's understanding of what the rendezvous radar state was, was causing other work that the computer was doing to get delayed and delayed beyond the duty cycles it was expecting. And so when this happened, it basically restarted everything afresh uh, with uh, new resources, eventually, you know, memory cleaned up and those processes started up again, they were able to execute for a while again, and then this would happen again. And it happened a total of four times during the landing. But as they moved from uh, P64, which is uh, the major mode program that handles the visibility phase into the P66 phase, the final descent phase, there's actually less compute involved and then these problems went away. So they were ultimately able to uh, land successfully, and um, it's amazing to me that they held their cool while their computer kept on blanking out on them. Um, this is really cool footage. Uh, the, the image on the left is 16 millimeter film footage out of Aldrin's window, but the footage on the right is the real cool stuff. This is done, this is essentially Google Moon being used as the Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory data using the uh, lunar module's trajectory to actually paint what that picture looks like uh, during the landing. And you can see a lot of those big boulders. They're at about 500 feet altitude there, and there's a lot of big boulders that Armstrong needed to fly over. Um, one last thing about the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, after they did their EVA, they climbed back into the lunar module and were starting to get some sleep. They looked at the, on the floor and they found that a cover to a circuit breaker that armed the ascent engine that allowed them to lift off the moon had broken off. And so the question to Houston was, how do we arm the ascent engine so we can get out of here? And after some discussion about that, they concluded they could take the cover of a felt tip pen and jam it into that circuit breaker to arm the ascent engine. And that's how they ultimately left the surface of the moon. It turns out Aldrin, he's, he's uh, still alive. Armstrong has since passed away, but Aldrin still wears that on a necklace around his neck. Um, I would like to talk about, there's a number of other mission experiences. Uh, I'll, I'll, I see I have just a couple of uh, minutes left, though, and I, I have a couple of other slides. So there's a number of uh, other interesting things about how the computer was used and what issues they ran into. Um, oh, boy, I got to get, sorry, I've got to go buy all this stuff real quick. My apologies. So I wanted to say something real quick. Uh, it turns out that the Russians had concluded that they were not going to be successful in their uh, lunar aspirations without also developing their own computers. So by 1968, they had developed the Argon 11C. And uh, if you look at its specs, it's somewhat similar to the Apollo guidance computer. It has roughly an order of magnitude less memory, but uh, and about a third the flops rate. But uh, in many other respects, uh, size, weight, and power, it's very similar. And this computer was used successfully on their Zon 7 flight, which is the first time that the Russians were able to circum, circumlunar fly uh, around the moon and then back to, back to Earth. Um, that was an uncrewed mission. That was just a probe. 
So computing um, has played a very essential role in the Apollo project. Um, simulation and modeling was used in almost all major vehicle designs. Uh, I'll just show real quickly, I didn't uh, found this recently. These are some of the uh, finite element models that were used to model the whole Saturn booster and some of its bending modes. Uh, both Apollo both drove innovations in computing and, of course, benefited from them. And in all likelihood, uh, if we hadn't had the advances in computing we had, we may not have won the space race. So having uh, advanced computing capabilities helped the U.S. to win the space race. And uh, that's, uh, oh, uh, there's one other thing. There's a bunch of links for uh, other resources I have here on the last slide for those that are interested. I could probably fill several slides with links, but if you're interested and you have the hard copy of the slides or, or electronic copy, you can find those links. And, uh, and that's it. And thanks for everyone's time. And I see I just, uh, I think I'm just up on the hour or maybe just a few minutes left. No, actually you did fine. You mar uh, mark five minutes to, to 11. Oh, okay. And we have two questions here. Um, first, what lessons can modern HPC software developers learn from Apollo? Well, um, you know, I think some of them are the lessons uh, that they learned at the time after, in retrospect, in the, the 19, early 1970s, they reviewed all the work that had been done, gone on <clears throat> and, uh, and had some lessons learned. And I, I probably could go back to that slide here, but, uh, trying to remind myself what they were. One was documentation is absolutely critical. Um, they uh, overall spent about 13% of their software effort on actual documentation. I don't know if we have projects today that actually spend that much on documentation. I suspect projects today spend a lot less time on documentation, uh, most of them. Um, uh, let's see, the other one is having a well-designed uh, software development plan and executing it. And if you have to make changes in those plans, you know, communicating it to your stakeholders. Uh, another lesson that they learned is more programmers does not mean things are going to go faster. Uh, another question here, Mark. Uh, uh, well, first, uh, a very nice talk. That was a compliment. With a deeper understanding of the challenges encountered during Apollo 11, were you amazed that things worked? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as a child, when I saw, because I, I, you know, my father, you know, was uh, definitely following the space program. So I, I was like right next to him watching it on TV. And as a child, I just saw it as a big adventure. But uh, this more recent experience of learning uh, everything that was involved, I, I'm just stunned at actually how dangerous these mission, missions were. Um, there were many, many, many ways things could have gone wrong. And um, and I think ultimately they didn't because of the amount and quality of training and contingency planning they had. So Ashley, uh, would you uh, open the mic for eventual questions? Or, um... Well, in any case, I'd like to take the opportunity here to thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we want to improve this series, so please give us feedback. So these slides are uh, and the recording are going to be available soon, uh, uh, by next week. Uh, I'd like to announce the next webinar in this series about a month from today. It's going to be about software management plans in research projects. And the speaker is going to be Shoaib Sufi from the Software Sustainability Institute in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And the, uh, we have already an event page, and also if people would like to register. So we have everything in place already. Ashley?